Boy, you have bookends if you got those two more shit. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
to work together and be more cohesive and I guess share more of the reps and, and be able to build off one another. Uh, so I, and like I mentioned before, the defense is, is, is known to be good and I think this year it's gonna be, uh, they're gonna be just fine even losing uh, Ben Burke Irvin. So moving on to the concerns, I do think that the biggest, one of the biggest concerns is uh, replacing Miles Gaskin, uh, but they do have uh, Salvan Ahmed, who is a much better uh, open field speedster, uh, but he does lack a little bit of creativity and patience to uh, picking the uh, running lanes. But they also do have Sean McGrew and Kamari Pleasant, who will work in the rotation to help him out. Mm -hmm. And they also have incoming freshman uh, Cameron Davis, who could probably see some touches as well. Right, and out of Salvan, Salvan's uh, 104 attempts last year, he had 698 yards himself, which is about a six yard average each carry and seven touchdowns to his own name so like as you mentioned before they have a lot, a lot of young talent so they're probably going to be a running back by committee type right and it addition. also helps that you have the right like uh offensive line the offensive mm -hmm. line's going to oh, be big they're going to push body so whoever is like getting touches back there they're going to be okay yeah just uh, fine Another, another concern that I have would be linebacker uh you might have mentioned that they do have some talent there which I, I'm not disagreeing with that right but I do right. think that replacing Ben Burke Irvin is going to be tough just because he had 176 tackles by himself that's that's fair and I, and I understand that he he was you know, like I said key to the defense especially right smack dab in the middle of it but I, I do think that with the, with the depth and experience and it, being able to you know rotate guys get fresh legs in I think they'll be okay with yeah trying to replace him right they had Brandon Wellington and Ryan Bowman mm -hmm. who did see a lot of start time last year they also have a sophomore Ariel Nagata who's very interesting and he's very exciting to watch uh, they also have Joe Tyron who could help, but the main thing is they need to have somebody step up and fill that massive hole there. And that's what, and I think that's what might happen, where it's somebody, somebody like even like you mentioned, Brendan Wellington, uh, he might just pop out and actually build his own name, just like Ben Burke Kirvin did, and, and get 100, over 150 tackles himself. Yeah, it'll be very exciting to see that. Uh, but obviously, losing star like linebackers like that, also both safeties, it's going to be huge because they prevented a lot of big plays mm -hmm. happening. On their defense. Right. Uh, and then moving on to one of my concerns is I'm going to mention quarterback play. I know Jacob Easton uh, is a transfer quarterback from Georgia. I know that he was a very highly touted quarterback at Georgia, although he did sit out last year. Uh, he did was injured his second second season over at Georgia. Um, now I'm just going to say that I, I think he might have his shoe, the shoes might be too big for him to fill over there. I do know Jake Browning uh, played all four years over there and he did very well, uh, taking them 12 and two, 10 and four seasons. Um, I'm just uh, I'm thinking that just for th with Jacob Eason's time off and maybe his, maybe his injury, um, I just I just think there might be a little regression there. I don't think he's the same caliber quarterback that he was at Georgia, but um, I just think his shoes might be uh, it might be a little a little hard to fill Jake Browning's shoes over at Washington. Yeah, I mean that could be said, but also uh, there's been some criticism of Jake Browning not winning the national stage games. Yeah, uh, like going to the playoff and getting stomped by. Alabama. Alabama. Yeah. So that's pretty tough. Also, last year's performance in uh, the Rose Bowl wasn't too great, especially because they were down for the early. majority of the game, yeah. and then and they came back, made it look pretty. But yeah, it was, it was but it was twenty-eight to three uh, till about the fourth. <laughs> yeah. Uh, moving on to again, I know one of my concerns and weaknesses of uh, the defense last year was the pass rush. I think they need to you know revamp that, get that back up to speed, considering that they only had twenty-four total sacks last year and sixty-four total tackles for losses as well. Uh, and like I mentioned before, we know Washington teams, are, Washington defenses are normally good, or they have become good uh, recently. That those numbers seem a little low, especially for a caliber like for a team that's at that caliber, uh, or at a, I mean, a, at a contender caliber. So you want to see, we want to see bigger numbers, especially in the sacks in the sacks department. So right. But moving on to the 2019 schedule, uh, they start pretty easy with Eastern Washington, California, Hawaii, at BYU. Mm -hmm and USC uh, at Stanford, Arizona, and Oregon. But the easiest start is at Eastern Washington, I mean, hosting Eastern Washington mm -hmm. and California and Hawaii. So, I mean, three games, three and oh, should be, uh, they did lose to California last year, but I mean, Jake Browning, I think, threw about two or three interceptions that game, right. which wasn't that great. No, it, does not uh, help, it does not help you win games. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Uh, but they, having that easy start should kind of uh, smooth in uh, uh, Jacob Eason mm -hmm. and kind of help him out, kind of just get ready for the whole season. What I, what I find a little crazy is that they have eight games before before any bye week, before they see any bye. Yeah, it's going to be tough. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very tough. A, uh, a, a long stretch, very long stretch. Especially with tough games at Stanford, I think that's one of the toughest games. Mm -hmm. And then having to play Oregon, which is a very hyped up team this coming year, especially with Justin Herbert, it's going to be it's going to be very it's going to be a fun matchup, especially mm -hmm. with both quarterbacks going at it, right. going after each other, and to see who has the better team. Right. And uh, I'm. I'm uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking right now at the USC. We're all we're all made, we're all kind of expecting the USC is going to get better than the five and seven record they had last year. Uh, but again, like we mentioned before, it's all down to the coaching. See what the coaching staff can do at USC and see if they can be competitive. 
yeah, we'll see that. And then after, then they have the bye. Then they have to go. Uh, then they host Utah at Oregon State, another bye <laughs> at Colorado, and then Washington State. Uh, easily, Utah's going to be the one of the toughest games in that. Oh yeah. In that. Uh, These final four games. Final four games. Yeah. Because Utah is getting the quarterback and the running back all back. So. Mm -hmm. Back from injury, uh, I'm I'm expecting this Utah team to get better, and I'm expecting the Utah team to be very competitive against Washington. Yeah, and could possibly compete for the Pac-12 championship. Oh, yeah, 100%. Uh, but looking at the schedule, what do you think the worst-case scenario is for this team? Worst-case scenario, I'm thinking this team uh, goes 9-3. and three. I mean, this is a great team. This it is a team under Chris Pearson who has done great things in his, in his, in his head coaching career over right. at Boise State coming over to Washington. I mean, this... This team, like you mentioned before, the toughest game I think is Utah uh, and or at Stanford. Uh, those, those two, those two teams are going to be really good, uh, especially playing at Stanford, which is always tough. Always a tough venue to play. And like, and I'm going to maybe side over with the hype for Oregon. I, I know there's a lot of hype with Oregon and Justin Herbert and and uh, and all that, but I'm thinking those three. I'm thinking they might lose those three games at Stanford, maybe the Oregon game. And the Utah game. Yeah, I'm gonna go uh, agree with you. I do think that worst case scenario is nine and three. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they are favored in every game, but they, are. they were favored last year in every game. They still ended up losing games. So yeah. I'm gonna go nine and three because they're scheduled with Utah. Utah's getting much better, mm -hmm. uh, especially at the quarterback position. Uh, and also Stanford. Stanford's always a competitor mm -hmm. in that conference, especially with uh, Coach Shaw. They're gonna no. be very good. Mm -hmm. uh, USC will be interesting just because you, we want to see what USC is gonna be now. Because mm -hmm. uh, if because honestly, it could be they could get stomped by Washington, and then yeah. USC just isn't what it used to be anymore. Yeah, it's it's all it's all it, we're gonna see Clay Helton. He's definitely in the hot seat this year. Definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what do you think most likely will happen? Most likely, I'm thinking it's a 10 and 2 team. This is a team very good, very talented, very deep, uh, and kind of young a little bit. Uh, where again, I'm gonna mention again, they're gonna probably lose the at Stanford in the Utah game. It's just, I just, in my, I, I'm feeling in my heart of hearts that it's just too much. It's gonna be too much for them. Yeah, I do agree with you. I do think 10 and 2 is a, I think what that's what they'll go 10 and 2, mm -hmm. uh, just because. I mean, tough games against Utah and Stanford. Heading to Stanford is going to be tough. Mm -hmm. uh, teams have gone in there and lost. I mean, Notre Dame has gone in there and lost. I know Notre Dame isn't very high up there for a lot of people, but Notre Dame's still a really good team yep. that Stanford plays. So yep. uh, I do think that 10 and 2 is probably something that they'll go. Uh, what do you think best case scenario is? My base has, my oh, excuse me, my best case scenario is going to be 11 one. I still th I think you know this team's very good that to the point that. They're gonna maybe overlook a team. It's gonna be it's gonna be a sleeper team that they weren't thinking, uh, they weren't really thinking about that they're gonna lose to. Although they could lose to you know at, at the Stanford game or the Utah game where they just got outplayed. But you know they might drop, might just drop one in the middle. Maybe maybe one of that paint attention. Maybe to USC. Maybe to BYU. Who knows? Yeah, I I would say my best case scenario is going undefeated. I do think that wow. this team is just that good. Yeah. And they have, I think they have the right coach. They have a good quarterback, a mm -hmm. very highly touted quarterback. Yep. Um, we'll see how he does in the system, but I mean he's already been, you know, a redshirt already for one year, and he's this is his second year going into the season. Um, he also had a good, really good experience at Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, leading the team to eight and five, which is really good, especially in the SEC. Respectable. Um, Respectable. And then they're also favored in every game. So yep. if they if they win every. If they do what they're supposed to, they should win every game. That's true. Um, and they have a really good hold right now on the Pac-12, mm -hmm. even if a lot of people think that they're they're trying to count them out. As long as long as they fill the key roles, quarterback like you mentioned, Jacob Eason, and the linebacker position, trying to replace uh, Ben Burke Kirvin. Yeah, I think it's a very good team, like from top to bottom. There really isn't a huge concern set for that running back position. Yeah, quarterback a little bit, and maybe that linebacker spot a mm -hmm. little. Like, yeah, a little bit. But I mean. I think this is team that's a very a, a very good contender for the playoff. They could be a very good dark horse mm -hmm. that a lot of people are kind of overlooking, kind of under the radar. A, th a thirteen and zero Washington team, you think is getting in the playoff? Easily, easily thirteen and zero. I mean, you beat their toughest teams. They beat Utah, uh, a team that can t can contend with just about anybody. Now, yeah, the one thing that will very be that will be very interesting is if they get matched up against Clemson or Alabama, Ooh. how would they do against them? That's the real big question. Yeah. Is, will, there, will there be a large disparity? Will it be like a will it be a talent disparity or will it be like just build, just size? I think it'll be more of a coaching thing. I think you have two oh. teams mm -hmm. where, you know, you have Alabama with Nick Saban who's been there multiple times mm -hmm. and then Dabble Sweeney who's also been there a few times yeah, as well. Recently, yeah. So it'll be like coming down to the coaching and also players, uh, the experience that they've they've been there in that mm -hmm. stage. They know what it takes to beat national champions. That's fair. Uh, where Whereas, you know, Washington, the last time that they were there, they didn't play as well as yeah. a lot of people thought they were going to play. Yeah. And it'll be very interesting to see that 
coming into this season and if they actually can get there. Yeah. Well, don't forget, it's Chris Peterson. We all know what he did at Boise State, winning with the, with the Statue of Liberty against Oklahoma and Bob Stoops group. Hey, you never know. It'll be very interesting to see that. Uh, thanks, guys, for watching this video. If you guys liked it, give us a thumbs up. Hey, uh, comment below. Tell us what you guys think about Washington and subscribe because it helps us out. Thanks, guys. <laughs>